Hello everybody! It's Friday, that means it's time for another topic of the week. So, first things first, last week's topic on the FAQ. Uh, a lot of good thoughts and feedback there. Um, it was, you know, obviously we discussed it more on the show this week. Uh, it was one of the longer topics of the week I've done in a while because I had a lot to say about it. But it seemed like the response was overall quite positive, so, um, you know, my hope would be that that kind of do-no-harm policy is is the way we think about it in the FAQ going forward and sort of think about big rules changes as being on that semi-annual, biannual, I don't know, the twice a year schedule. But for this week's topic, I wanted to turn to, uh, so, so uh, a viewer reached out to me and had a question about something on the show that I mentioned, uh, namely that the, since the Nurgle book, basically since we moved into the malign importance era at the beginning of 2018 and all of that stuff was written with aos 2.0 in mind right so by the time we got to the end of 2018 they knew aos 2 was coming that's likely why we didn't see as many new books up until that point because they were probably solidifying the aos 2 rules and so they were trying to or get it to a more cogent point to where they could then go backwards and design the other rule books to kind of work with it or finalize them. So since basically Nurgle, everything Nurgle going forward, Nurgle Legion's daughters, Ideneth, let's do this again, here we go. Uh, Beasts, Gloomspite, uh, Skaven, FEC, Corn, and now probably Fire Slayers. Did I miss one? Probably I did. Um, it's a, it's a statement right there. The fact that so many books have come out that I, I do forget them is, is, uh, is pretty great. It's a great world to live in. But the, I said, I've sensed a, a change in the way these books are written. And the viewer, hi, Robert, asked me to say, to talk more about, from a game design perspective, why I see there being such a marked sea change, because I really do think that there was, um, yeah, I think you can absolutely feel the difference in design. So I thought today I'd kind of expound upon that as the topic. Uh, the change in GW design philosophy. That's what I kind of want to talk about. But before I get into the specifics of that, I want to lay down some, just some ground rules or groundwork about the foundational elements of game design. So I did a lot of game design for many years, uh, wrote many books, consulted with game companies, and did freelance work for them, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I, I spent a long time in this world, the better part of, uh, you know, more than a decade doing this. Uh, and in that time, I thought very deeply about the nature of game design, wrote a lot about it, used a lot of sort of theory in my own games and stuff like that. And game design is, is a very interesting beast because we as the players of the game innately think we're pretty good at it like oh we play the game so hence we're must we must be good at at designing the game which is patently false okay um if you haven't spent a lot of time doing game design you're probably not very good at it that's just, you, you know, if I said go write a game, you would come back to me with a pretty awful game. Um, that's because it's a skill set, like anything else. Like, the people who write these games that are very successful, they have training and skill and understanding. They have built up a knowledge base over a lengthy period of time. Of course it's that way. And actually doing the thing is not the same as playing the thing. Driving a lot doesn't let me build a car. Flying on a plane a lot doesn't make me a pilot. Playing games doesn't make me a game designer. Now, game design isn't exactly analogous to all of that because going back to, and I talk about this in, in a couple videos I made. I, I made a video once about the, the importance of Rule Zero. A long time ago at the sort of birth of tabletop role-playing in the world of things like D&D &D and stuff, the, the game designers rightfully said put in this rule zero concept of like whatever you think goes for your game that makes it better do it because that's right our rules don't matter you know Gygax has a very famous quote that like if <laughs> that like once the players figure out that they can write all this themselves they won't need us anymore right 
paraphrasing, obviously, horrendously, but that's the idea. I, I actually think he was wrong. Um, I think he v vastly undervalued. Now, maybe at that time, when everybody was a nascent game designer and didn't know what they were doing, frankly. Um, like, if you look back at the late 70s and early 80s, there are a lot of kernels of amazing ideas in there in a lot of pretty poorly put-together games. Um, games that just do not hold up to modern design. But, of course, like... The idea of cars is great, and the first is, and the very first cars that were made had concepts we still use today, but we're not driving original model cars around from the 19 aughts or 10s, right? Um, so, like, I, I don't want anybody to think I'm saying they're all bad and that that's all to be eschewed. I'm saying that, like, at that time, the delta between of knowledge of what you could have between somebody who was experienced in game design and somebody who wasn't was very small, right? And so natural skill or talent or insight or genius, something I do think Gygax had in spades, um, or he and Arneson and, and a lot of other sort of visionaries at that time, um, that made up the delta for them. But the empowerment means that we all got this sense of sort of pseudo entitlement, right? That, that we can write the rules for the game. Now, at the same time, that doesn't mean our voice doesn't matter. I actually think that no one's better at finding problems with a game than the players. That's why playtesting should be such a critical part of any game design, and of Warhammer specifically, uh, because your users are excellent at finding problems, but very bad at finding solutions. That's true in software design, it's true in everything. Um, so, like, we're all very good at, at identifying problems, so if the community is screaming out that something's wrong, it's wrong. Like, that's... That is very, that's pretty basic. So in no way am I invalidating that. It's just how you come to the solution is that's where the expertise is required. Um, again, to continue it, I, I know when my car isn't working, but how to fix it, I gotta take it to the mechanic, right? If you know how to fix your own car because you are a mechanic, you can do both. Uh, all right, so that's just kind of laying down some basics. And that probably sounds elitist or haughty or something like that, but I think that's not at all what it is. I hope I hope nobody reads it as that. Um, what I'm saying is that players are invaluable in the process, but that, that there is absolutely a skill that has to be learned, understood, and refined to designing a good game. Okay, so that's groundwork. Now let's talk about GW games. So, Games Workshop, from my perception, this is my outer perception, I've never worked there and have no true knowledge of how they run their games, um, but my perception of especially many of the first 20 to 25 years of the, maybe even 30 of the, the real existence of these games, um, was that they were a fairly insular company. Um, you often came up through the stores, you eventually got your way into headquarters, and you kind of, everybody who worked there was sort of part of the, the family. And that meant that people often had a great time working there, and it was, it was a really good atmosphere, and people's ideas were often, people were very empowered to bring their ideas to life. So you had really unique, creative things flourish, because if you had somebody who was hyper-talented, there often wasn't, you know, there at various points in, in the history of the thing. Um, you might have been able to bring that to market with, with a uh, perhaps a more of an ease than you would normally have at a company of that size. Again, I don't know that for sure. That's just perception, and I don't think I've ever seen an interview go into this kind of level of historical detail. But one of the downsides to Games Workshop's insular nature for a long time was that all of their designers were just trained in whatever their method was, whatever, however they decided to do it inside. Whereas if you look a lot of, at a lot of other successful game companies and you look at like the roster of who makes up their design department, it's people who've worked at a dozen companies, especially if you're at like the top of the market people. Um, they've worked at a dozen companies, they've worked on lots of different types of games, they probably published some of their own games. Um, you know, the ability to, and, and because of that they've had all these different interactions, right? Um, they, they, they bring this very heterogeneous knowledge set to the job. And so uh, what happens is you, you bring a large understanding of different shops, design philosophies and processes and things like that in there. 
Whereas my perception of, of especially the I don't know, early period of Games Workshop on is that they often didn't seek that outside talent. Part of that's probably just location-based. That is to say, like, a lot of this talent was not readily in the UK. And that's not an insult. It's just like that was, didn't happen to be where some of the larger game companies were um, outside of GW themselves, like especially in the tabletop role-playing world, which was often in either the US or um, continental Europe. So, uh, And, you know, maybe people didn't want to go move up to the to, up to Middle England. Um, so what that meant is that, like, throughout the time period of their... When they're making their design, they have their own internal processes and their own sort of way that they think about things. But it's always still very individualistic and it's very insular and it's very much them. Games Workshop games always felt like Games Workshop games. That's a good thing on one hand because you have a very strong brand identity. And it's a challenging thing, on the other hand, because you might not be using the best tools that are available in the market. And by tools, I mean just like the tools of the trade, the way that you technically think about game design. Um, because the... And there's lots of theory that's been written out there by people like Robin Laws. If you really want to, if you want to learn a lot more about people who've done a lot of like really, really high-level thought about the nature of game design, you know, just go look at like... Go look up Robin Laws, go look up uh, the big game theory, right, or something like that. You can you can find all sorts of interesting and great articles written by experts and people who I, I think have put uh, a, an academic level work into this. <clears throat> but, you know, the rules, the specific rules, what's on a war scroll or what's in a, you know, what happens with a sword, that is literally the last thing you should care about when you're doing game design. It, I mean that literally. Like, chronologically, it is the last thing you should care about. It's the ephemera. It's the simplest of things. Um, it's an engineering problem that just needs to be worked out at the at the end of the process. So it's also the thing, by the way, we complain about the most. We as players often complain about this sort of thing the most. This thing, individual game element X, <clears throat> this war scroll, this one rule, this thing, we don't like it. It doesn't fit it's too powerful it's too weak it's too whatever but from a game design perspective it's that's the least important thing you should be concerned with that is to say maybe not least important last i'll stick to my previous statement chronologically there's a whole bunch of other stuff you have to do first and that's the kind of and, and then there's a whole process of how you have to move through those steps so you have to understand your sort of guiding principles what is this game about what are its goals and all of those things, like what type of feeling, what are the themes I'm trying to pull out? And I don't mean just narratively, I mean the themes of the how I am trying to experience this game. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example, because I know I'm talking in very, in very much theory craft right now. Um, let's talk about the idea of determining granularity in combat. I'll make this very real. Uh, in some, there's a, a couple Wild West style games where combat is very brutal, very deadly, uh, and very fast. That is to say, like, it's representing something that happens fast. And it's traditionally one-on-one. -on -one. So this is like your, your shootouts at high noon. Uh, which didn't really probably happen, but it's cool uh so the in this game the sort of initiative order and the granularity of what's done in combat is down to like the microsecond the holster the way you draw it the way you pull back the hammer the way you squeeze the trigger the the shot the type of case on the bullet everything matters right because in those little details are where the deltas come about to put one bullet into your enemy, which will probably be lethal to them, or at the very least, greatly incapacitated. Right? And, and the game is supposed to, like, that is the action of the game. It's the center point of what happens when, the, when, in, when you're in, like, a high-tension combat situation, is 1v1, <clears throat> gun against gun. Right? And somebody's getting the business end. And so you want all this rich detail 
and like rules weight around that. Okay, well to get to all that rules weight, I had to understand all this other stuff first. Because if I tried to take that system and stick that in like D&D &D combat, where it's meant to be much more abstracted, much more fast. I'm, I'm meant to have lots of combat tonight. It's meant to be a largely dangerous world where the, you know, where the heroes are heroes and can mostly walk away from their fights, you know, injured but alive. Uh, and you know, a common spear isn't da it's dangerous, but it's not like real world dangerous. Where if you get hit by a spear that got put in some like pretty gross dirt, the wound gets infected and you die, Khal Drogo style, right? That's just not what. That's not the level of of D and D, um, or or Warhammer for that imagine right? Like imagine if that's how you had to resolve every sword stab of of a guy in your unit. <sighs> like nope, not playing this game. So my point is, is that like the the ephemera of those particular things derive from these larger concepts. Okay, this is gonna be another long one. All right, so I say all that to say that the transition into AOS 2 and the books leading up to it, to me felt like they absorbed a lot more of the industry practices and thoughts around this stuff. So I started to see things like it felt more like they had the concept of guiding principles acting upon each book. Wherein, and, and you, you, can, you can interpret this from things they say, like they started using different language in the podcast you watch, if you watch interviews. They started using like industry terminology a lot more commonly. Um, they started thinking about things of like the methods and modes they wanted the army to be able to operate in and the opportunity cost each one of those would percent. That's a great meta thought. And you can see that in the design where they say, <clears throat> what we want this army to be able to do is A, B, C, and D. And so we're going to put in these options that can all be put together here. So they're understanding the dis distinction between building uh, in a linear fashion and a modular fashion within an army book. I did a whole video on linear, on linear design versus modular design. You can go look that up if you want. Um, and they, they started like very finely creating those things and creating the natural paths for people to start grabbing different pieces and putting them together, sometimes as their whole army, sometimes as a coherent part. Uh, to help shape people's play experiences into not only a way that would be fun and rewarding for them and discoverable and interesting, but also create a unique play experience for that army. It would play in this way. You can build in this group. You take this group of things. The army plays in this way. That's a rewarding thing. And, and you feel, and then the army has this number of options, A, B, and C. And when you put that together, you get the greater feel of the whole force and what it's capable of, right? So it can be faster, or it can be more damaging, or it, you know whatever. But it can't be it can't be super tough and anvilly or something like that, right? Whatever the the sort of bubble or box that they put around the force. So I felt that's a big difference. I felt them use that. The standardization of the language is another big one. If you look at the books, you can see that they started operating from a dictionary. This is something that they've talked about on occasion. Um, so they started operating from a a, a, a language rules dictionary. Um, which is basically where you have this sort of giant, not glossary is the wrong word, but like, I don't know, codex of just verbiage. It's literally just like sentence fragments and strings and verbiage of like, this is how we deploy clean language. And so you always start from that and then you just change the few individual words of whatever you're needing to do. I you swap, you know, generally you write this stuff like boilerplate legal contractual language where you say like, you know, this unit may use this command ability during the, and then it's, you know, name of phase and brackets and you replace that and so on and so forth, right? When I've seen these kinds of um, game dictionaries used before and, and I've used them as well in, in design, it's just a good way to make sure that you're consistent across, because when you're writing a game, um, and this is even if you're doing it yourself, it's very hard to keep consistent language. If you're working across a team, you have to have something like this, or you will get language inconsistency. It's just, it just will happen. So I noticed that. <clears throat> they also became a lot more mindful of the beyond just like, so what I would call UX instead of the UI. Um, so the, the, we don't think of games as having a UI very often, like that is a tabletop role-playing games. They do. They absolutely do. Um, 
you know, in a video game, we're keenly aware of the UI because it's the thing we're sitting there staring at constantly, right? Um, it's, it's just like, it's, it's literally in your face. And I have hated, grown to hate certain massively multiplayer online games when they were, when they were a thing I did a lot because of, like, clunkiness in their UI. UX is sort of a greater concept, right? So, oh, by the way, like, the UI in your tabletop game is whatever you happen to be interacting with in the same way. Um, for us, that's the War Scroll cards. And by the way, you can see improvement in that, too. Look at the marked improvement in the War Scroll, War Scrolls, War Scroll cards, whatever you want to say, um, post-AOS 2. The cleaner nature of the way they're delivered, they were often shortened, clunky language removed, clunky text was removed, things were separated properly, a photo was added. Like, these are small things, but they matter, right? They're, they're, that's your UI. Uh, as well, by the way, the other part of your UI is just your book layout, which has also become good, except for that Path to Glory thing. Move it. Um, so that's, that's that layout is the other part of your UI in tabletop RPGs. But the UX is something bigger, right? And it's sort of how you come to experience the game and how easy it is for you to understand the rules and deploy them, how easy it is for you to understand the various game elements and interact with them. And that has also, I see that improve a lot because they, they do things like, a very simple example of a sort of UX improvement is every time they've removed additional rolling for no purpose. So... Like Blood Warriors, instead of when you roll a save, if it's a six, then roll another die. And if it's that, nope, nope, stop, stop all that. Just stop, right? Just if you roll an unmodified six, then this thing happens. If A, then B. Boom. Simple. Clean. Uh, efficiency is uh, maybe one of the most important things you can keep in mind when you're writing game rules. So... A lot of like just extraneous extra rolling was cut down. Now there's more they can do here, by the way. Um, I think this is something they've been exploring more recently, um, but they could go farther. <laughs> and I hope to see that continue to involve, evolve. Um, you know, the other thing, the the biggest thing people latch onto is actually one that like represents the real horns of this, which is the holy within thing. Holy within can often provide for a, a worse. UX, if, especially in certain cases, of, you know, trying to keep a big unit holy within something. Uh, but it also prevents a lot of bad actions, right? Um, it's a real tricky one. So they, they basically decided to, that, like, this somewhat, this sometimes bad experience of trying to keep your, of fighting to keep your unit within is worth this other thing, right? Which is the sort of cleanliness of experience and how buffs can apply and how easily things can stack and how much they can control how much the table gets affected by a buff and so on and so forth. Fair enough. Um, so I, I've just seen a lot of marked positive changes in that way. If you look at the War Scrolls, a lot of them have been simplified, scaled down, and that, by the way, none of that means power gets removed. Like, you can have... The simplest scroll can be the most powerful thing. So none of this is, is power-related in any way. It's literally just cleanliness of the application of the rules. And I've seen just a marked improvement of that um, when I see what was long paragraphs shrink down into simple text. There's probably still some work they could do with that. Uh, the immediate thing that pops into my mind is their current language around what I would call like PBAOE command abilities. Right, where like, you know, character activates a thing on themselves and it then creates a bubble around them. And the way that they have to phrase that to be absolutely clean right now is like, when you activate this, choose a model with this ability. Okay, I'll pick myself and then everybody near that chosen model. And it's like, that's a long way to go, <laughs> right? For what is to say everybody around me. Now, there's a reason you can't write stuff like that just because it's not as clean. That's probably the best they could come to, but there's still opportunities there. Uh, but for the most part, it's gotten a lot cleaner. So those are the kind of things I've seen. But I wonder how much that's actually clicked with everybody else. Because the, the person who wrote to me said, you know, they weren't sure they could feel it, or that it was real, or that they noticed it, or these were elements that really mattered. And it's interesting because it's something I'm very attuned to, because I think in these sorts of terms from years of doing it. But I did wonder, well, how much does everybody else feel this change? So that's my question. 
only took 25 minutes. These are just going to be long topics of the week. Don't, don't get addicted to this. I can't promise this will happen all the time. But how much does everybody else feel this change? Do you feel the... Do the does the UI UX does that do you feel the cleaner nature of it? Have the and and as much as possible, let's stay away from the specific ephemera, right? The the like this specific example. I've been using examples to like really just uh, expound upon an individual element or concept. But I'm not actually concerned with like oh yeah, I really much like what they changed on this war scroll. Like cool. But that's not really what I'm talking about, right? Overall. Do you feel the improvement? Do the rules in Toto seem cleaner? Is the does it seem easier to execute? Do you notice these changes in how you can read and interpret the rules? That kind of stuff. So that's this week's topic. Another long one, uh, but we got talking about game design, and that's always going to be a ramble from me. So there you go. That's the topic of the week. Uh, the improved game design of GW. Look forward to your responses. As always, drop them down in the comments below. Or if you make a response video, link me to it, and I'll put it. I'll drop it down in the description. But I appreciate you watching this one, and as always, we'll see you next time.